So <clears throat> the reason we're started, I'm starting here, is that to some extent Barcelona as a um, as a city was a really big catalyst in urban design and landscape architecture since the 1980s, and it really revolutionised how we think about cities and. A lot of other cities in the world, including Cape Town, um, it's had a huge influence on urban design, and so it's a logical place to start. It's also a logical place to start because of the fact that the uh, that um, that it's a transition between architecture and landscape architecture, where in a way it comes from an architectural perspective because most of the work that was happening in Barcelona was architectural, where architects had not really worked as architects for many, many years. It was a largely academic discourse. And so what had happened was essentially that um, suddenly architects found themselves in the landscape trying to design urban spaces, um, and they were trying to do something that they didn't know anything about. And that's useful when somebody tries to work outside their discipline and we start to learn things about our, for, the, for the landscape architects about our own discipline in that process. Now, who's been to Barcelona here? A few. Now, it's a, obviously it's an amazing city. It's like a, one of the great cities to, to visit. But it's important to understand a little bit about the context of Barcelona in terms of the, the, <clears throat> the sort of political milieu that the city was in. Now, as a city, Barcelona um, uh, was obviously and continues to be part of the Catalan uh, nation. And so um, during the Franco regime, uh, which ended in the late 70s, there was, a, it was basically a fascist regime and that, <clears throat> uh, uh, that regime really suppressed Catalan independence and suppressed Catalan expression. But at the same time, as we would probably know, uh, you know, people like um, Gaudi were actually uh, undertaking quite amazing architecture, and there was a strong architectural tradition in Catalonia to do with artisans, particularly around brick and brick vaulting, etc. Now, um, <clears throat> if we think about it, I want to just step back a little bit and talk a little bit about about a framework that I approach this subject from. Now, the main framework I would probably approach this subject from is from this idea about the relationship between object and field. That's why it's the first lecture. And so, to some extent, because of the fact that the um, that you know obviously these architects were were working into landscape from architecture, architecture, you know is traditionally, I suppose, regarded to as an object-based um, discipline. Not always true. A lot of architecture is very, very contextual. But the dynamic and the spatial dynamic of it, I would argue, is to some extent internalized. The object of lens of architecture is looked at directly, is moved around. Even if we're now in the computer, we're in Revit, we're in SketchUp, when we're in orbit, we're always in orbit around an object. When we look at the ground, if you've tried to do this in, <clears throat> which the landscape people have, often trying to say, what am I, what is the thing I'm looking at? But I'm not looking at a thing, I'm looking at constellation of other objects. Now, architecture does that too, of course. It's based around a city location, but the dynamic is quite different. And I refer to this as a, an object field distinction. Now, the idea of the field has really come forward in um, in the late 20th century, early thousands, as a really important concept. And so, that concept really uh, uh, really is around a movement, particularly from sculpture, which we'll talk about later on. But what I first want to talk about is the idea of the of the city as fabric versus the city of object. And so this is when I talk about postmodernism here, it's very important to understand that when we're talking about the work in Barcelona, we're talking about work that has um, arisen after postmodernism. So tell me about postmodernism. What is a feature of postmodernism? How does it, you know, architects do a lot of this sort of theory? Yeah. 
Come on, guys, tell me about postmodernism. Tell me about modernism. It was a reaction. Um, it was, but what sort of reaction was it? So, yes, it was a counter reaction. But what in particular was it? Rob, what was what was it rebelling against? Yeah. Mm, sometimes, but not always. Yeah. Functionalism. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Well, it's against uh, rejecting the historical past. It's more like it's brought back the ideas of the world of the century. It did do that. And so, uh, in, in a sense, it became more symbolic and it also became um, less what you might call logocentric, which is to say that in a way, modernism was based around a, sort of the, uh, uh, an essentialist idea about the world, which is that there are a series of essential truths that um, architecture is in some sense eternal, um, that, you know, even though there's been a critique of, uh, on the one hand, modernism regarded itself as rejecting the past, but obviously a lot of people were talking about this idea that modernism was ultimately very much based around the same values as classicism, which is one central tenet of what it was. Now, with that rejection, and I mean, there's so many different areas, like once you reject a series of, once you reject a kind of logocentric or a straightforward um, sense of meaning, a singular sense of meaning, a lot of things get problematized. So once you, once you um, disqualify or change the idea about the single subject, in other words, that, that for instance, Le Corbusier's male figure where all of the geometries arise from a, a kind of a subdivision of an ideal person who's a man, as soon as you bring in, question those values, suddenly other people come in. We have, as, other, as another student said, we have different ideas about race, we have different ideas about gender, sexuality, etc. And so suddenly the idea of function, which is designing around one single idea of, or one single model of a person, is problematized. So you can't say that function is straightforward because of the fact that each function presupposes one particular type of subject. And so that's a key thing that comes out of postmodernism. And so another thing about that is that there was, as a sort of side movement of it, and it's definitely not true of all ideas about postmodernism, but the role of history also became, uh, in a way it was recognized, for example, that you couldn't escape from history even if you wanted to. So there was no ability to you to suddenly say, there is this new future. For those landscape people from last year, if you might remember when we talked about this idea of the zero point of the Renaissance, which is that the Renaissance, Mignolo arguing the Renaissance was a zero point after which things were civilized, before which things were barbarian. You know, similarly, the breakdown of modernism is a recognition that historical context affects everything. It's everything is contextual. Now, for the city, it also meant some of the a changing around and an understanding of the city in different sorts of ways. Now, I'm going to start with these two diagrams because I think that they're important. This is from, from Colin Rowe's Collage City. And we have a basic and important relationship here, which is that, that here we have a city of fabric. And so, in a way, whereas here we have what you... What, what, what Condon, um, Patrick Condon called the sort of object in the round, which is that the modernist tower is viewed, you know, as an object in a space of landscape. In actual fact, the pre-modern city was in actual fact uh, a, a, a figure of object, a continuous figure in a way, because, or a continuous figure or a continuous ground of objects. So the figure ground, in a way, this relation means that, for instance, the object of a building is actually understood always contextually in relationship to the rest of the shape of the city. Whereas if we look at, for example, uh, a project from modernism, we see that, that the object is sitting in the field and it has a totally different um, visual relationship, experiential relationship. You know, this, 
is a space that one moves through. This is a space that one moves around. One views the object in certain sorts of ways. The, you know, a lot of talk was had at the time around ideas about movement and time. And this is where in art we have people like the um, cubists looking at objects from multiple viewpoints in the same way that we can look at this object from multiple viewpoints, whereas in a way here, the street narrates the view of the building. Here, the movement of the human reorganizes the landscape. And what happens is that the, two, the sort of space that occurs is totally different from the two. And on one sense, the landscape seems to be, and this is where we go back to Corb, we know that the, the sort of changes of density like this are key to um, ideas about uh, landscape and its sort of therapeutic value that landscapes you're surrounded by landscape and it's we surrender the ground space for landscape and we build up into towers and thereby we have more access to landscape landscape is healthy this is the 19th century city etc you know the old city was seen as congested etc now of course we know that I mean essentially both of these are density solutions they're differentiated by their their site coverage and their, the way they allocate their density but the spatial condition, I think, is really important. And with this also comes something which is about time. And so here we see an example I've used quite a lot, which is from Rossi, where we see the Roman theatre, how this object in the city changes function, where it's a theatre in the Roman city. And then during the, um, the medieval period or the after the sacking of Rome, and the fall of the empire, the, the theatre gets colonised by um, to become a city wall, and then over time the city builds up around the around the figure, and eventually the figure is gone, but its footprint is left in the city. And it's something I talked about in ACD last year. But and so this is this idea that the figure is both the object is both something that is a sort of form, but it's also a series of content of, of uh, consequences over time. It's a, it's a series of influences on the shape of the city. Now, <clears throat> the reason why I start with this, and we'll go back to more definitions of this, is that to some extent the reason why Barcelona remains in its position is the Eurocentrism of the, of, in a way, the perfect city. The perfect city is generally based around and has been based around largely the model of the city from Europe or from also potentially from you know that same discourse then appropriated Muslim cities and the cities of the Sahel uh, in Africa as well where they were about the idea of the dense city and of course why do we want density in the sort of in the principles of urban design and sustainability why do we want density why do people care about density Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So resources, and so obviously the reason we want density is that we're trying to, is that obviously, obviously, there's a sort of a pragmatism about the distribution of services to spaces around density. There's consumption of. Um, yeah, Maria. Sure, Barcelona you're talking about here? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're going to get to that because we're we're going to talk about that in a second here. But if we're talking about generally the European city and density. Yeah, the European city, they were protecting each other. Yeah, that's right. So it was like country and city, and city was dense. And so but that's a reason, but why, what's the reason why we want density now? That's infrastructure. What, infrastructure, yeah. And so I think that, um, I think that, that also because of that, uh, of that we want it for infrastructure but I think if we look deeper deeper than that we also want it for sociality because there's ideas about you know sociality is so tied to health and so the distribution of people is both it's like a chicken and egg thing we distribute people further we need more infrastructure so they can get closer to each other and so it's a kind of sociality it's an economic it's a distributive system these days it's also a lot to do with farmland um, etc now <clears throat> Uh, it's also, you know, in terms of the quality of urban space, 
this is where we find an interesting paradigm here, which we kind of know about a lot, which is around, from South Africa, which is, of course, around the idea of overlooking and the idea of eyes on the street and security, which is that density also improves security um, because there is more supervision of the street. So on the one hand, you're in a situation with modernism where this was seen as, as, as a, like the reason that Central Park works as well as it works is because it's got a super dense city around it. And in actual fact, it's a palliative, it's a, a response, a fixing of the city. And so that model would seem to work. But in this situation, as we know from places like the UK, probably from the Soviet Union, I'm not sure. But, you know, a lot of the time when one finds towers in, um, my main precedent would be the UK, towers in parks, we often have, you know, quite dangerous spaces with long distances between them, with very little oversight, etc. You know, if you go to the Cape Flats, you know, that model, although it's not this sort of model, the townhouse model surrounded by, with a school in the middle of a piece of big open space, is also, you know, a similarly difficult precedent. Now, if we go to Barcelona, you know, it's important to, to understand that, that, that Barcelona as, the, as a kind of, was also the quintessential urban design exercise in the 19th century. Whereas Paris, to some extent, you know, you could have said was a major sort of urban design exercise. Um, Barcelona was interesting because of the fact that it was uh, recognizing a, a sort of political and economic transformation that was occurring. And if we look at these, these images here, particularly this image, what you see is here is a series of uh, small towns. So we have Barcelona, we have Clot, we have Badalona, etc. And these, these small towns were effectively all walled, as Maria was saying, dense, um, protected um, small cities. And essentially what, what's happening here in the 19th century is in a sense that after the, with commerce, with stabilizing political situations, with changes in defensiveness, defensive structures were holding down the ability of 19th century cities to cope with influxes of population, industrialization, changes in, in uh, infrastructure modes, etc. And so to link those together, there was a competition, or th there was a competition entry that was undertaken in 1855 by Ildefon Serda, called the Eschempler. And really the process was reasonably straightforward. It was literally to draw a series of major circulation lines between the, or major boulevard between uh, the smaller towns and then the, the superimposition of a grid across that uh, landscape to join those together. Now this process, even though this is a very unusual, you know, this is the the shape of the Eschempler. Um, this is a very unusual approach in a sense, but these days the ideas of conurbation are so common. So conurbation refers to where a number of cities begin to coalesce and join into the one city. And so co conurbation since the car has become probably the main paradigm. And one of the reasons we have problems with density, which is that we have problems with sprawl, sprawl with cars, distributing further out. There's functions that have to be provided out of the city. Once we've got things like service centres, car showrooms, they're not going to be able to go in the centre of town. Um, you know, we're seeing the same thing happen at the, you know, the foreshore at the moment as the car, as that's densifying, you know, the places are moving out further. And so conurbation is not new, but obviously this is prior to the car. And so Sir Dar's model um, was to uh, to really, uh, on the one hand, preserve and just pragmatically keep the old Barcelona centre, and then set up a series, set up this series of parklands, um, linking up all of these different pieces of um, towns that were nearby, and using this grid to come across. Now the grid as a figure is also, as you remember from those of you who did um, ACD, the grid as a figure is a real totalizing figure. It's a, it, it crosses and everything and, and links everything together. Now, Serdar's system, which was quite elegant and 
you know, still referred to constantly is in the, in the grid, what you face is the fact that the grid is continuous and non-centralized, non essentially. And so with a grid, in a way, it's not like you can say in the old city where there was a, a single nodal center. Now in the grid city, the grid's, the grid's propensity, if you want to say, it's what it does is it ex extends. And so in this sense, what happens is how do you, how do you um, offset the fact that the, the, the sense of the grid is it's an expanding outwards colonial structure with the need for identity of location within it. And so Serdar's scheme, which has sort of always been interesting since then, was to include these sort of, uh, to create squares at the grid intersections of the streets so that essentially each corner of the grid becomes a local node. So if you perhaps lived in any of these four, that's your square, that's your square, etc. And so it's a way of maintaining place within a structure that was essentially placeless. Now, obviously, so also, you know, there's within, obviously the square is not a new, uh, the perimeter, this is, you know, a perimeter block is not a new um, invention in Europe. But nonetheless, the idea, at least in the city, was that that the obviously there are these courtyards, which are effectively light wells to allow light into the center to be able to gain height. And the idea was that these could also get sort of the ends of these could be punched out to be able to allow for spaces that continue through. And if we look at, however, if we look at the diagram, and I mean, if we look at the if we look at the city, you can see some of these that's happened, like there's one where it's happened, but the other one's closed. There's another one where it's open. Now, not a lot of these were actually built in the end. And if we look at what was built, I suppose it's a reasonable amount, but uh, you know, this is the, this was the ultimately kind of the extent that um, it had been built initially. And now it's, it's still not as kind of massively uh, covered as it, as it was. And so, um, if we think about that sort of period, then I'm just going to now sort of jump. That's the sort of framework, the public space and the civic architecture framework of Barcelona. Now, after the end of the uh, regime of Franco and an election where a guy called Ariel Bahigas, who was an architect, was elected, um, there was a process and then there was the bid for the Olympic Games in Barcelona, which was... Was it 95 or 96 or 94? It was 94, wasn't it? I think it was 94. Mm. So I want to look up Barcelona Olympics on their phone. Um, and so, oh, was it 92? 2012? It was London. There was there every three years, aren't there? So it was 2012, 2000 was Sydney. Um, 92, 92. So in the process, and this is a big thing, that this is another reason why Barcelona is really important, is that the, the, the idea of a catalytic event is really important in aspects of developing a city. And if you look at South Africa, you think about the World Cup, you know this, right? It's a common thing. And, you know, I've always thought that, you know, and I've tried to do it and it never quite worked for me, but basically if you want to go and get a lot of experience working on something in a very quick time, then turn up in a city where there is a massive event going to happen and turn up in the sort of five years, three to five years out mark and you will get work. Because inevitably there are huge capital injections into cities where, where this stuff is happening and there are big offices employing people. And so, um, but, but, and so what they did really is they, is in the city of Barcelona is they received this sort of after the, you know, Bahigas gets in, they get the, win the Olympic bid. It's symbolic as well as, you know, very important. And they undertake a really interesting system. And it's best, I think it's represented quite well by showing you this series of maps. Now, I told you guys before about this idea that um, we were back then starved for precedence. So we had nothing, right? We just like, someone would bring a book back from travel and it would be like, lent out to everybody, photographed, turned into slides. There was... And so I remember my first, the first, one of my lecturers went to Barcelona and, you know, and they received this pamphlet here. And what it looked at was a series of, of places where, 
um, there were these uh, areas where um, projects were occurring. And so really, in Barcelona, they set up a kind of urban cocktail model, which we still utilise today. And so that cocktail, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's super basic and super important, and the cocktail was really like some sort of civic, some sort of civic or public building, whether it be a library, a hospital, um, something like this, some transport, piece of transport infrastructure that tied that facility into a larger network, some sort of private or quasi-private public partnership housing, provision to work after the after the after you've injected something in terms of a public building after you've then injected the public transport node then after that comes a catalyst for development some development some sort of public space uh, development to stitch all of those things together and also often some piece of public art so the ideas we have about public art in space a lot of them come from Barcelona and so when you see, go to the, when you go to, I mean, the influence is so huge, you know, if you go to the, the, the foreshore, um, no, sorry, to the promenade and see artworks there, that language is, is so much of that is developed from places like Barcelona. And so these areas here represent a sort of decision by the council to say, if we have to inject something somewhere after a long period of repressive regime, where would we inject it? And so in a way, all of these zones are, essentially they were maps. And so the idea was that when you came to visit, you could walk around and you could see and visit all of these different um, public projects that were regenerating and developing places. And so those were all itineraries that give you a sense of what was happening. And as we look around the city, we see that there is a kind of like a, a distribution. Now, people talk about urban ac you know, acupuncture and etc. But that's actually been, this is a model that goes back a long way. I mean, I don't I mean, I'm sure the Barcelonans didn't invent it either. But it's a, it's a kind of useful way to, to think about. It. I mean, it's no different from Cyril Ramaphosa walking in the, you know, seafront a few days ago and this morning in, in Google Etu, you know, um, at sea points a few days. So it's this thing about distributing attention to get a sense of the way that the terrain is being occupied. Now, over the time, extra Ones of these got developed, and I mean, here's me walking my, writing down the routes that I was taking to look at all of these. And so each time, ones, they're getting filled in more and more. And this one, we're starting from 92, then we're going to 81, 96, and then, you know, finally we have the, the last ones where they were out. And so each one is demonstrating a, um, an intensification of development of the city. So with that cocktail in mind, um, it's also important to recognise that there are, uh, there are things that are happening. A lot of this stuff, for example, was actually happening in the zone that was outside the old city, but a lot was also happening in the, in the old city. And so if we, if we, you know, just to quickly sort of talk about this cocktail again, here, for example, is where a couple of projects where, you know, public art was included into public landscapes. You know, it's not stylistically, I'm not even slightly recommending this work. But it's as a precedent, it's quite interesting, you know. So, and so, you know, here is this Parc Miro, and so there is a kind of Miro sculpture located in it. You know, this is another small park. And, and the reason I used to call this lecture Archite architectural excursions into landscape is that you get a sense that as the work gets more sophisticated, initially the work starts to become all about putting in objects into landscape until eventually it becomes focused around the part that's more interesting, which is about configuring the surface itself. Um, and so the old city, you know, a lot of the old city was, uh, was also being upgraded in the process of, of, uh, um, of regenerating for the Olympics. There was also a kind of replacement of infrastructure in the city. Now, this project, I think, is really important also because this woman, Carmen Fiel, uh, undertook a series of projects both on her own and with her, um, uh, her partner, uh, Andrew Ariola. They undertook a whole lot of projects. And this project, for me, is a really important one. One of the histories of, um, 
of Barcelona is also that Barcelona was a city where, um, in a way, the only viable anarchist political period was during uh, the sort of 1930s in Barcelona, where there was an anarcho-syndicalist, series of anarcho-syndicalist movements in Barcelona and the unions effectively took over parts of the city. They started collectivising and it was a really important uh, anarcho-syndicalist city. And uh, people from all over the world, including from the UK and Europe, a lot of people went to fight against the fascists um, in Barcelona, which was seen as a real utopia developing. And one famous instance and, tra and local tragedy was that, that when there was advances happening uh, in the city by troops against the, the fighters, um, they sought refuge in this church here. And uh, in actual fact, the church did not let them in and they were massacred out the front of the church. And so this square, um, you know, became a symbolic kind of ground where... Uh, it's both a public landscape, so it's just a modulation of surface. Modulation being the key term here. It's not like, you know, if we're trying to speak about an object and field sense, this is just a reorganisation of the surface. There is no object sitting here. This is creating space. And if you look at the fact that, you know, here's this, this woman walking through here, you can see the scale at the centre is that this is actually an enclosure. It's a fully enclosed space, but it's doing it all with grade change as one moves down into there. So at its edges, you know, it's not that steep, but overall it's an immersive space like that. And obviously this pay it's simply paving. There's not much detail. The grade change opens up the wall, and on the wall surface is something memorialising that relationship, speaking back to the church behind it. So it's a powerful political memorialising act. Not surprisingly, it happens after the um, end of that regime, yeah. Was this, um, just, was this before May Lynn did the memorial? Well before May Lynn did the memorial. And so, you know, this is where, this is where, you know, this project was, was before May Lynn. And it was also this thing of, the, what we, you know, we'll talk about later, which is this idea a colleague of mine calls the anti-memorial, which is that it's, we're used to the memorial being an object, but in actual fact, this is the idea of the memorial as a space that we're occupying. It's not something we're looking at. It's an experiential condition we're having. It's visceral. It's not visual. Um, now, interestingly for me, for me, and this is why I'm a really, it's really important that to understand, and if I was trying to talk about, about the, the idea of field, this is in a way a core project about that, because it's all about the ground plane and making space with shaping the ground plane. Obviously there's parameters that are important here now. This is not, obviously this is not these days wheelchair compliant. So, but nonetheless, if you were doing this these days, you might calculate those grades by maxing out the wheelchair grades and then creating that sort of space. You might run a ramp through it in some way, in a sort of subtle way, whatever, but nonetheless, you're seeing the ground as creating space through implication. So if there's one word you want to write down, it's implication, because implication is the core thing that landscape is about. The object is not about implication. The object is about finiteness, definiteness. It sits there in space. You look at it. You can't look anywhere else. It gets your focus. The ground plane is about implication. It moves you, but you're not always sure how. There may be a path. But, you know, you can't get to the edge of this space and be disinterested. You're going to have to make a decision where you move, how you cross, where you cross. It's using the surface to do that. Now, crucially for me is that when I first went there was the prior to digital period. And so I still don't have any of my original slides from when I first went to this project in the, late, the middle 90s. But when I went back there, this had happened. Now, for me, this was a real crime, which is that you get something which is about subtlety and about implication. And, it, you know, we don't need to mark something in the centre here to be able to say, I have a centre. We're implying a centre through the way we shape the ground. And so, 
when I talked to Kame, who I know about this project, I was like, I can't believe they put that in. And it's like, she was like, oh, it's because the mayor had this idea. He said, oh, there's a center. You have to put something in the center. And so in a way, it totally took apart the sense of what that landscape was about. It removed its kind of implication. Now, um, these sort of, in a way, these things are in, if we're thinking about this model here, these spaces, like a space like that, is inserted into a modulation of the surface inside the framework that's created by the architectural container. So it's, it's not, if we think about this as a paradigm, it's an insertion into that object. It's not, for example, a thing floating in this landscape. It's embedded in a surface. Now, my lens, in a way, is floating, is doing the same sort of thing. Now, um, at the same time, people were also in the city looking at uh, looking at uh, in putting nature into the city at the same time. And so part of the cocktail, the, the idea of green infrastructure, which we'll talk about, was not really around yet during this period. And so, you know, to some extent, it was... Uh, it was a quite a new thing. And so part of this sort of cocktail was also about naturalizing the city. And I've always found it interesting how in these places that are so urban, small amounts or relatively small amounts of vegetation can make a huge difference. And so here we see, um, you know, often, and my favorite example is, is probably, um, is probably this one where it's almost simply one tree is actually making all of the difference in how this space is operating. That tree is like a person standing there occupying a space as a participant. It's not a mute, a mute thing. And so this, this also comes with an increased idea that the city is an ecological space. Now that's very well established now. Our students who undertake um, landscape systems Hopefully, we're having conversations about that in landscape systems. Um, because, you know, a woman called Anne Whiston Spurn, who we'll talk about later in landscape urbanism, you know, Spurn wrote a book called The Granite Garden around the time that these projects started, where she described the city as, an eco as a natural system. Where she didn't say the city is a cultural thing and outside the city is where nature happens. She said, let's change our account of the city and let's actually describe it as nature. So the gap between two pavers is a soil profile. An ant is a piece of fauna. Some moss is a plant. The, the, the piece of moss growing in the crack with the ant going through it, the moss is creating a microclimate with different temperatures and different moisture levels. And so with that became a real interest in inserting vegetation into the city and some other things that I think demonstrate some of the novelty of, of Barcelona and uh, landscape architecture. I mean, here, this is a really interesting thing. What's happening here, horticulture people? Yeah? Come on, tell me more. Write a, speci write a specification for those trees for me. Yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, more, no. Come on, look at the plant. Look at what all of them have got. Huh? Yes. Come on, you guys. Have you done plants and design yet? You have. What's this here? And that and that there. And that there. Huh? It's a graft. And so what's really interesting about these things is like, grow yourself a tree that's this tall, taller than people are, and then graft yourself on top of that tree a lemon. And so effectively what you're doing is you're creating a standard. So sometimes when people create standards, they'll like standard roses or citrus, you'll put the, you'll graft the plant onto the rootstock because the rootstock is stronger and more resistant to plants and disease, to diseases. And they'll put the, graft the other plant with, uh, compatible plant on top of that. So effectively they've grown this really quickly and really tall as a rootstock, cutting off the side branches and putting all of these different uh, things on top of it. 
And in actual fact, now we have a standard tree with um, on top of a uh, very long rootstock. And so if you imagine now the, the one that's in your garden, it's buried about there. <coughs> so that's a really weird thing to do and really interesting thing to do. And I, what I liked about this is that I was staying with these people in here and they were reaching out of their balcony to get lemons off the tree that was in the street, you know. So the idea even that you would design the plants themselves, not just plant them, but design the organism is also a kind of, and a sort of little insight into Barcelona and sort of novel sort of thinking. Now, at the same time, other parts of Barcelona in the city were also being regenerated. And this is where we have to understand some of the effects of density here as well. And so, you know, when you try to put a, a uh, you know, renovate or put a metro under the city or improve the city, you're also creating enormous sort of disturbances. And so I talked to you guys about this cocktail. And here we can see where um, the, this existing square, which is actually on the edge between the Eschempler and the old city, it's literally in here. So you walk out of the old city onto this square and you can see that obviously here is the escalator into the ground. And we have the standard sort of, um, you know, what the French would call equipment of the city. And so, in a way, this is where we, uh, the reason why I also talk about Barcelona and urban design is that if you said what is urban design to a landscape architect or even an architect in Australia, they would say, oh, urban design, where it's, where it's very much focused on small spaces in the Barcelona model, less so than the Cape Town approach to urban design. They would say, oh, it's putting in bins, seats, increasing public amenity, um, etc., production of quality public space, safety, um, you know, injection of business opportunity. And so here we start to see some of the aspects that we now recognize automatically as, as arising, which is, you know, here is the seat. The seat is being treated as a, as a spatial element, again, via implication. So you can see that. There is, uh, you know, an edge over here and the seat is in a way demarcating this space through here via implication from this space through here. We see a, a sort of fetishization of paving and organizing surfaces. Important precedents for this are obviously Paris in the 19th century. But, you know, we can see how there's a, become a real fascination with the materiality of the street and, and suddenly how you lay the paving what the painting does in terms of implication, how it may or may not build a, a kind of desire line, may, may or not be the functional diagram, how you might des de design standard modules and reuse them, all of those things, a lot of this comes from a culture of urban design that arose in that period of time from Barcelona occurring. Now, you know, if we look at what happened immediately after that in Australia, the city of Melbourne, was really involved in that. I mean, you know, the city of Melbourne, an urban designer from, uh, from UCT, a guy called Rob Adams, moved to Australia in the late 80s. Um, inspired by this work in Barcelona, he undertook the same type of approach, which was material-led, um, the same idea of cocktails, facilitating adjacent building uses, etc., etc. And so this is part of that thing, which is when we're not just, not just, you know, if we think within the period that this started, it went from projects that were looking like um, this, objects, every single opportunity for making an object, you can have a piece of art like another object, little towers, etc. You move into a space where suddenly the language of surface, material, you know, where the, the you know what is what is less where there's a sort of a real deep fascination in this fabric material fabric of the city you know if you look at some of this admittedly these days when we've learned from Barcelona and Barcelona was a laboratory Barcelona was a place where we now look back and go to Barcelona and say oh, this failed that failed that failed that failed but they were treating the city as a laboratory because there's no place in more flux than the city. Like the city is constantly being turned over. And so in a way, if you wanted to test something, you know, the city's as good a place to test it as anything because these days, most very few things in the city last for more than 15 years. I mean, you know, Green Market Square will get ripped up sooner or later in the next year or two. Probably 
St. George's Mall as well. Nothing lasts more than 20 years in a city these days. So if you're going to try something, you may as well try it and, and see what works. And so we learned a lot from of our urban detailing from the city. Um, obviously, before we will have a quick break and return, but you know, obviously the most just to sort of step back a bit. One of the most famous projects, obviously of landscape projects of um, of Gaudi, was also Park Well. Who's been to Park Well here? Who went to Barcelona? And I mean, it's an amazing project um, of artificial topography, stepping down the hillside, where on the one hand it's a sort of like a surface, and then on the other hand it's also you know it's a structure, um, you know. Uh, and a, and, a, and a space. It's a piece of architecture. It's a piece of surface at the same time. Okay, let's have a quick five-minute break, and then we'll move on. Okay, so just to continue on, um, so. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk around this object field thing again. And so if we think back to this, just to sort of summarize again, if we think back to this, you got, can you guys get this relation I'm talking about here? Objects you move around in the round, they're entirely self-contained. We look at them, you know, versus the street as a perspectival frame where the building is the edge and the street in a way is the center as we move through. Um, this, you know, um, and the way that landscape is cast as kind of other. And I think this is an important thing we'll get to in a second. But um, in terms of the, of the um, who's seen this lecture from before with me? It was Dudley talking a little bit about this. Anyone seen that? No, maybe I didn't give it last year. Okay. Yeah. Good revision, huh? And, uh, and so the, uh, one of the, the key points that I was talking about the object and field in relationship to urban design in terms of, of landscape architecture, one of the main places that, that it has come forward is through uh, changes in the way the object is seen in art since postmodernism. And so Rosalind Krauss, whose essay is included on the uh, Vula site if you're interested, um, and you know, in your readings if you were demonstrating that you'd actually read the other things by Krauss, for example, that would be good. Um, she wrote an article called Sculpture in the Expanded Field in this book, The Anti-Aesthetic Essays on Postmodern Culture. And she uses this thing called the Klein Diagram from, uh, that's a sort of a thing used in psychology, but it's a lot of it's around trying to break down binary oppositions. And so what's a binary opposition? Yes, I mean, you'll know this from art school I presume as well but so it's like yes no is a binary there's we can't imagine what one means apart from understanding its opposite so you know you can't understand yes unless you understand what no is, is this a, like, black and white with no grayscale? that's right it's absolute difference and so part of part of what happened during the period of postmodernism in literary theory was uh, an interest in understanding that words were meaningless apart from their relationship to each other. So we can't understand yes unless we understand no. And so instead of words, again, that's the eternal thing. The eternal thing would be to say everything has an, an absolute value, but in actual fact, postmodernism was everything has a relative value. And so the ideas of, the, of relationship become very important in postmodernism. And so here, what, what, what um, Rosalind Krauss is doing is she's setting up and trying to break up the binary oppositions to create a sort of third term between things. And so she's saying that architecture and landscape as object and field are, or as object and field are in a way seen as opposites. But what she does is she tries to use this thing called a Klein diagram as a way of trying to bring out a non-binary other term. And so she starts a lot of the time, if you can see, that classically in sculpture she would have said that sculpture is not architecture, not landscape, it's sculpture. And here she was really talking about something and its plinth. And so, for example, an example that, that, that Krauss would talk about a lot would be 
the um, uh, road, uh, like Rodin taking the sculpture off the pedestal. And so suddenly the sculpture is scaled to a person scale. It's sitting in space that's occupied by a person. There's no longer a, a plinth mediating its relationship and saying, now look at me. Now it's part of the same sort of plane. And so, but, so this is a classical relationship where the object is on a plinth to say, I am decontextualized. The plinth negotiates my relationship to place. I don't have a direct relationship to place. The plinth moderates it. And there are a number of different sort of models that she, she talks about in this process. And, I, and I'm, I have to be, you know, to be honest with you, they're quite, they're quite complex and I couldn't be entirely be bothered unpacking them. But I think we have to, to notice some things that were happening in this time, which is that, that noticeably the artwork left the art gallery. And so what happened was we started to see conceptual artists operating in the landscape and that landscape um, either, either in terms of this idea of site construction, which uh, she, she utilizes talking with Michael Heitzer here, you know, we're talking about in a way the artwork is in itself configuring and making its own site. So whereas previously the artwork stood on a pedestal within a space, the white cube. Here, the, this model is creating, a, using the artwork to structure an entire space. You know, Sol LeWitt here is, is, instead of leaving the white cube as the background inside which the objects stand to say, I am an art gallery, he's in a way drawing attention to the surface of the white cube to say, to, to bring an awareness of the implicit ideas in the context, and then Smithson here creating this, um, the spiral jetty, which is a kind of both on the one hand, it's, it's a sort of phenomenological work, which is that, you know, as one walks along it, one is engaging with time through the process of navigating with it, navigating along it, but at the same time, it also acts as a register of the site because it starts to interact with the salt lake and starts to accumulate salt crystals, etc. So we can see that art is really changing. Now, Beth Meyer, who we'll talk about in a minute, utilizes this model, but if we start to, to sort of, um, you know, branch out into landscape from, in Barcelona, from this sort of change of relation here, you know, uh, to some extent, you could say that there was a lot of the projects that were arising during that, period in Barcelona, which were about working with the site as a kind of found condition. Now, if you think about the 19th century park, or the suburban park either, how much of the original site is there? The, the, the estate has cleaned it all as, you know, perhaps if it's a, a state, the, the city is built out and the space is just the leftover and there's no real relationship to site that exists in those places. Now, obviously, we know that there is because there's always an economy, like there's a lot of writing around Central Park and how it relates to geology. But nonetheless, to some extent, there is a kind of a, an overwriting where the universal type of the park is imposed onto every space. But in Barcelona, there are a series of projects that really try to utilise um, existing site characteristics. Now, one of them is quite important at the time. And again, we're thinking here about that not just Barcelona as a project, but Barcelona is something that is that um, is actually injecting a whole lot of stuff we now might regard as normal everyday urban stuff. This project is nice. It's, it's, a, it's located at Mont Jui, which is like the mountain of the Jews in Barcelona, where the, the Jewish cemetery is up in this area. It's behind the city itself, next to the end of the Diagonal. It's where Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona, it's part of the same uh, building context or the same, pardon me, ge geographic context that the Barcelona Pavilion was built on on the other side. And in this spot, the, the, this project by Beth Garley, who was a really important uh, architect who became a landscape architect afterwards, designed this really nice sort of sequence where she sort of works, you work your way up into the site, which is, you know, sort of up this entry path here, 
Now, if you've been to or had a look at the High Line and we start to see the way that grass grows between the parts of the High Line that have been left out, we can see that that sort of approach is happening here. So you can see a lot of debts all over the place. And as you kind of move up the hillside into this sort of quarry space, you then reach a threshold. And in that threshold, you then have a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a pause. This is a very contemporary art thing. And if we think about um, uh, other work by people like Michael Heitzer, if we also think about some of the work by, um, what's his name, the uh, Tilted Ark. Um, uh, oh, I forgot his name. Anyway, experiential art. In a sense, what this is doing is it's marking that threshold. You can see here are these columns of the columbarium. And then what's happening is that we're moving through this threshold where the trees and the columns are placed on the same grid as each other. You can see how the topography is organized. So we hit a set of steps. We have one level. In the middle of that forest, we then have another set of steps and another level until we then emerge through the other side of it into that space through there. And so there's a really nice utilization of the site character because the path is moving you up. And in, in a way, it's elongating the threshold between the procession of the path and an entry into this space. It also is utilizing trees to create a space. So this is a, in a sense, this is quite an architectonic thing because it's a recognition that this is already a compressed space. These trees are being utilized as a canopy under which people are occupying. And then as you move forward, then you're confronted by the overall the overall surface of that uh, rock face. And so obviously then, as you can see from here, everything in the space is all pushed back to the edges and it's all the focus is on what the, the surface of the wall. So it's actually treating the surface of the wall as an object. It's clearing out the foreground and then it's putting things like, again, here is this sort of multifunctionality you see in a lot of Barcelona projects where the edge of the grass is also a location of seats. And so it's both marking the, 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 the material change between grass and gravel. You know, on this side here, we can see these sort of structures for seating as well, but, or for a water feature really more. But ultimately, what's interesting here is that I always think of this structure as entirely kind of unnecessary and as a desire to sort of have the sense of, I must build something, I'm an architect, I must build something. And to some extent, it's totally irrelevant compared to that elevation. So the idea of utilizing sites like that is really important. Um, and that's, I, th I sort of was tying that to um, Robert Smithson here as an approach with site specificity. Quite a new thing to some extent. Another project of a similar type, you know, in another quarry, ex quarry site is this one by um, Martorell, Bohigas, Mackayan, um, 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 Hugh Domench. And uh, this is basically a swimming pool with a, uh, that also frames the rock face around it. And you can see that part of the sort of architecturalization is the creation of as much infrastructure as possible. So the work is not sparse. It's not like they're saying, I'm all about landscape. There's also a sense of like, they're trying to have every opportunity to build something as possible. So even while there's a fascination with sight, it's a visual surface like up here. It's a, the site is a visual surface. And here, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on different types of seating, etc. You can also see the, the piece of art and this idea that there is always a kind of conceptual art piece in every project. And it's not a piece of what you would call plonk art. It's generally a piece of art that's built into the overall structure of the, the whole uh, site. And so that's one sort of modality out of um, Krauss's, uh, Krauss's project or, or schema. Uh, another one that, that is really important, I think, is this sort of um, dynamic between uh, the ground and the structure. And so... This is a project, these are a couple of projects here actually by, by the architects um, uh, Biaplana and Pinon. And interestingly, there's the name you might recognize from here, which is quite important, is um, Enrique Morales. So you, I presume 
architects would at least have heard of Enric Morales and um, landscape architects worth knowing Enric Morales as well. And Morales, you know, you have to consider that when these projects started, you had generations of people coming out of architecture schools who haven't built anything. So people are scrambling for any work they can get in this time. And so a lot of people who became famous architects got their start by doing landscape projects because at that stage there was no landscape architectural profession in Barcelona because effectively the whole city had become, there was no public space, public space was totalitarian space. And so, you know, the earliest were people like um, Teresa Gali Izzard, who was an agricultural scientist. And so this project's interesting because it also, if we think about this Sol LeWitt example here, what I was, the point I was making about this is that, in fact, by drawing on the wall, in the same way that the sculpture stepping off the plinth makes you in the same space as the sculpture, by drawing on the wall, the attention is drawn to the white cube and its surface as, and stopping of that being neutral. And so there's an interesting parallel to that in this project here, which is um, for a railway station. And essentially the railway station is entirely, this surface here is like a concrete, concrete slab with all of its associated structure on top of the railway terminal. And so there is no ground here. And so the way, and I think this is an important example, is one of the ways that the designers dealt with that, that sense of the, of the surface being entirely artificial, was to actually emphasise the junction of the structure with the ground. So instead of the actual structure going straight into the ground, by putting these feet onto it, which are of course probably not very relevant in terms of fixing the thing, you know, all of, the, all of the actions going on underneath here, they're nonetheless telling you're acting as if they are holding up, as if this whole structure, this tall structure is just sitting with its feet on the ground. And so in a way, in the same way like Maria was mentioning that there was a breakdown of symbolic or meaning, or rather the symbolic was coming back, like modernists would hate this because they would say that's not function. there's no functional reason why you would have that. Maybe it might be stopping it swaying from either side, but there's a thousand other ways this could be done. This is really about expression in some sort of sense. Um, as well as that, all across that surface, you know, we start to find some, again, key things that we, we can recognise where the seat and the wall, multifunctionality starts to occur. Um, other structures are elevated in the same way. And, you know, if we look at the plan, we can also see that it's a an entirely kind of compositional arrangement of these urban elements. And indeed, the term urban elements was a big thing in the time. And now, somehow in urban design, urban design is just about the placing of urban elements to some extent, in a space, that is from a sort of spatial point of view. But interestingly, Morales also did this project where, at the same time, where for uh, Biaplano and Pinon, which I think has been interesting to some people in my generation a lot more, where, where they were really structuring the terrain, although it's quite compositional, by utilising a really minimal sort of language. Now, if you've seen, anyone seen this before, where people use these balls as a way of demarcating edges? So Barcelona, you saw it first. That's, that's where it came from. And so a lot of this stuff, people are you know, still utilising those kind of ways of operating. And here, these guys, you know, forget, let's forget that structure again. That's that's architectural fear of having to not have no, no opportunity, any opportunity to make a structure. But what is more interesting here is is a the way that the drainage structure of the project is being featured. This is something we'll come back to more, where infrastructure becomes a part of the language of the project and as celebrated. Now, if we think about Paris, that's what happened in Paris a celebration of the sewer system, a uh, celebration of the building of the city as civic infrastructure. And so here, if we think again about the implication language, here we have a very open space that's being set up via implication with the surface stepping down. I mean, that's quite a beautiful way of dealing with this. So instead of having a long slope that's graded or instead of having big platforms, what we're, uh, what we're doing is that we're actually um, 
stepping it down over small into inter, sort of single step intervals right the way across the site. So it's like a step stair that, um, ramp that runs right the way through the site. You know, featuring of these sort of drains, um, the utilization of these lights as implication ge geometries, etc. And I think this works interesting because it starts to be much more subtle. Now, in the same, you know, for Beth Meyer also utilized the uh, schema that um, that Rosalind Krauss utilized as well to talk about the relationship between object and field. And so she really changed it around and talked about it in relationship to, to figure and field, she calls it. And so she talks about four different um, four different types here. And, you know, the first one, which is the most basic one, she calls landscape for architecture. Now, I'm not anti this. This is where, you know, there's some, there's some situations where the answer to the project for the landscape architect should be, don't do anything, just do grass up to the building, work on articulating the object as an object. And so there's some, some like if we think about the Villa Savoie by, by Le Corbusier, that if that building was, was surrounded by forest, it would lose its entire meaning. Its meaning is about its difference to landscape. So sometimes the job of landscape can be pulling back and embracing that. And so that's a role, but that's very much the traditional modernist role. When we look at, when we look at the example from uh, Le Corbusier of, of this, this is very much that, where where this here is the landscape, is the context for architecture. It's, to use Beth Meyer's term in here, it's the feminine for the masculine landscape. It's the opposite to, uh, sorry, it's the landscape as feminine to the masculine architectural object. She also talks about this thing that she calls the minimal garden, which is where she says, you know, that it's a discrete objectified field or a taut surface. And so I always think of this project we just talked about as an example of that. The ground plane is continuous. It's a tight ground plane because it's all about the expression of surface. It's about paving pattern. It's about looking down at the ground and the objects are discrete and they are sitting on that object surface. Now, you know, she also then talks about um, this thing that she calls the figured ground. Now, next week or in a couple of weeks time, we'll give a lot more discussion to that idea of the figured ground, but a, a sort of a key example of it from that period would be this project by um, Fiol and Ariola with the artist uh, Beverly Pepper. And if we were talking about, you know, I was talking about Plonkart, you know, art, art that's in a way sitting in amongst the landscape or it's just an object that you stand there, look at where its context is limited. This is an interesting project because here the artist is a collaborator in the project. And so this is also starting to become a process in a time where urban design has become a, an interdisciplinary practice, which is what, in a way, what, what all practices these days as a designer. You know, there's no architectural project without a civil engineer, quantity survey, there's no landscape project without a without a, you know, a civil engineer and without a, potentially these days also without potentially ecologists, etc. There's no urban design projects without economics people, etc. So all of those things are, interdisciplinarity is also something that emerges from this period in urban practice. But here we can see that the object, at some points it moves between being an object, so at the entry to the space over here, when you come in you can see that, that these these mounds are effectively becoming a, an entry gate that you move through and then over time that object then changes to become something that structures the surface and then at other points it's then disappeared entirely and it just becomes a sort of a, a blends back into the infrastructure of the site and so if we're talking about the relationship between figure and ground that relationship has become destabilized to this point where the object is both an object and it's a figure and it's a ground and it's structuring all of those things and it's coming from an interdisciplinary practice. Um, now, you know, Morales obviously 
continue to be a really important influence on, span, uh, on uh, landscape architecture and, and working in that sphere. And one of the projects, probably his best known project, and his, probably his best project, was working with his partner at the time, Carme Pinos. Um, and I would argue that Morales' best work came from that period when they were collaborating, and ho her best work too. Uh, and this is the Igualada Cemetery. And again, my, these are not my photos because when I visited it, it, it was really in the stages of, uh, of uh, slides, and so I've lost all my slides. And you can see here, it's Apolele can tell us all about this project, can't you, Apolele? <laughs> but uh, as he routed it last year, but um, you know, it's, it's embedded in a, in a sort of a terrain, and so it fits within the context of this sort of site-specific approach. And in a way, if you think about the kind of contours, obviously contours are just a graphic that's used to describe terrain. Contours don't exist, they're an abstraction. Nonetheless, there's a sense that they become part of the figure as we move into the back of the gully. And then in that space, we have this, uh, this uh, burial configuration. What's it called this? Do you remember? Did you find out what they call this? Crematorium? No, it's what is it? I don't know. Is that, I don't know what you call this, but it's actually not an uncommon way of being buried in, in Barcelona. And so they're sort of in, entombed in these little boxes here, which become, again, multifunctionally, they become part retaining wall, part burial surface, uh, etc. And, you know, we start to see here some things that are very, you know, this is the Gabian. Here we go, Gabians. What year is this? You know, 1985. And so a lot of the precedent, again, coming from that period that we now see so much of. You know, as we move into the centre here, you know, these, this is sort of pay, uh, uh, timber set into the final sort of tombs in this space. We also start to see some of this sort of expressionistic tendency in um, in Morales and Pinos' work of the way that they are starting to work with the geometry of the site, where it's a kind of scatter pattern. Again, if you think about this, uh, the buildings and the way that, that people are utilising this sort of scattered, ra seemingly, seemingly randomised pick-up sticks geometry that you see on buildings all over the city at the moment. Um, in a sense, what I like about this is this is as much... This is not about this, this pattern is around that surface and that materiality, you know. It's not just about a randomising pattern for the sake of providing sort of some level of funk in amongst your Revit model that's banal. It's actually about uh, working within the configuration of spaces of the site. Um, also, Morales went on and uh, continued to, to do work after he and Pinos broke up, broke up and he worked with... Um, Benedetta Tagliabue, I don't know I put Benedetta there, but Benedetta. And this project is the project Diagonal del Mar. The, and the whole of that part of um, Barcelona at the end of the Diagonal, and, if we, and the Diagonal was built as an extension of, if you go back to this diagram here, you'll see that that the original diagram by Serdar uh, had an extension of the diagonal down to the intersection of the river Besos, which is means like the river of kisses. And that was not built at the time, but later the diagonal was continued right the way down to the end of that river, and that's where the forum precinct happened. And that's where this did. So if we look at um, the diagram to some extent of this project, by Mirales, it's kind of, on the one hand, it's, it's a sort of like, a, we move into this thing with Mirales' later work where, where there's a lot of discipline that was lost around the way that, that Mirales was working with landscape. If we compare, say, the projects that were done here with the utilisation of, of kind of infrastructure, here the expressive opportunities of implication are utilising sort of uh, civil infrastructure or the infrastructure of parks. The sort of geometries of this here were sort of built into mounds. This sort of expressionistic tendency starts to get really kind of over the top. And while there's some precedent in it, perhaps, in terms of Gaudi, ultimately 
the sense of the control of landscape's own material, I feel, in his later work, starts to get kind of completely lost. Um, even though there is still this quite subtle and quite beautiful way of working with surface, um, smaller spaces, etc., the architectonic has taken over and some of the lessons were lost from that sort of period. Now, um, uh, one of the other things that happened at that time that was really important was that the, uh, during the period of postmodernism also, we start to see an interest in collage. And so if we've broken down the relationship to um, modernism, which was all about sort of platonic norms, um, all about things being, um, uh, you know, geometry being kind of eternal or there being a right way of doing it. Essentially, when we're in postmodernism, we start to see history as pastiche. History is something that can be uh, combined together through collage acts. And so this project, Parc del Clot, which was a real, during that time, a real iconic project from this period, it doesn't stack up so well over time, which a lot of them, a lot of them really don't. Well, let's find the, that's by this Frick, Danny Frixes and, and this guy Miranda, Parc del Clot. And here we can see it's a collage of a number of different types of things. We've got a bit of the, a little bit of the sort of picturesque park collaged on top of the grid. We have the previous um, archaeological structure of the site maintained here, um, but utilised differently. You know, we have a whole lot of the stuff that we've seen from other projects over here. I'll get back to that in a second. The, uh, the um, you know, the way that they deal with steps, etc. And by now, it's this is a real pastiche of a whole lot of different styles. So the idea being that you would move from this sort of picturesque moment, you know, across the, um, you know, you would move from the park across the hill into this sort of urban, urban space on the other side here with the infrastructure of the bridge being kind of celebrated. And so this is a kind of quintessential project. And when we think about Project Fly, Parc de la Villette, all of those projects from that period, collage was a major feature because suddenly the design process had been opened up in the same way that Solowit is drawing on the wall to say, no, it's not a white cube, that wall is just a wall, which is also something that artists like, um, an art theorist like Clement Greenberg were writing about um, Jackson Pollock at the time. In the same way here, these projects were saying, well, we can collage together different types of landscape because they're, this sort of sense of we're not insulting um, Central Park by collaging a bit of it with something else. We're actually recognizing that history is a material that we can draw from. Now, there's one other definition of I want to talk about of um, uh, of object and field, and this is I mean this is Burning Man. I went to Burning Man in 20, 2010, um, and uh, this is the, this is Black Rock City. You know, this is um, 50,000 people setting up a temporary city in the desert, you know, and this is, it was organized to be, you know, 12, 1231, 132, 230, etc. And then the, then the promenade A, B, C, D, E, and we were E, Edinburgh at 7.30, so we were, uh, Edinburgh at 6.30, so we were just, hold on a second, one, two, two, three, four, five, Six. So we were actually down here. But the reason I want to talk about this is that this is where the object and field relation changes. This is the last thing we'll talk about. And this is from a piece of writing by Deleuze and Guattari called um, A Thousand Plateaus. And, uh, people have went crazy in my period about these guys, but this, this is a very simple thing that I want to talk to you guys about. And they talk about two types of plane. And there's a play of words here as well. So a plane, you know, like the surface is a plane here. And one they call the plane of organization. Um, and the other one they call the, let me remember the name of the, um, the plane of consistency. And I'll explain them to you. And they're best explained via this image. And so the plane of organization, they call it a hidden principle. And you see they say memories of a plan, a plan or a plane maker which is that in this object field relation, 
what we are really uh, doing is we're also changing the relationship to the field. And ultimately, the plane is the field. It's the endless kind of surface. And the plane of organization is to say that in plan, you can put two things organized with each other in a certain sort of way that don't necessarily have any relationship to the phenomenal or experiential relationship. Now, because Google Maps has naturalized the plan view, in other words, we look at the plan view from Google Maps and we don't see it as an abstraction in the way it was, for example, when I was a student when you had to beg, borrow and steal aerial photography from the military, um, you know, and buy it for a lot of money. These days that is naturalized, but there is actually the hidden principle is that two things can seem to be related to each other in plan that have no relationship from the eye. And this is a really fundamental deceit that we suffer from as designers. And so when I say to, uh, to students that this is a real plan composition, what I'm referring to is the fact that the design is entirely around the plan and not around the experience. Otherwise, what we're always making is the assumption that, oh yeah, I always know what's coming from my plan. And so I'm putting these two things here because that's the most logical relationship for them in the plan diagram. We've had a lot of chats about this, Maria and I, over time. But, you know, there is a lot of, there is a really strong sense that that diagram, the modernist diagram, should be the way we understand things. But on the ground, we don't. And so, for example, while we could talk about this project here in terms of uh, the plan, you know, we can, we can find how we move into this space. Ultimately, we would need to be informed about that roughly from understanding the dynamic that has arisen through movement. When we look at the difference between this space here and what's inside it, there is an appreciation of the difference between what the plan would say, which is those two spaces are immediately related to each other, and what the eye level would say. And, and Deleuze refers to this, and Guattari refers to this as, they call this one the plane of consistency. And the reason they call it the plane of consistency is that time is narrative for us. Our experience of time is narrative. Maybe not in our dreams, but our, even in our dreams probably. Maybe not in remembering dreams. But it's narrative. One moment comes before the next. We can't, it's, it's consistent. It's contiguous. It flows. Whereas in the plan, you can hold in your mind two locations that are, hi, welcome, that are two locations that are completely discontinuous with each other. They might be five kilometers apart. And you can convince yourself that they're related. You'll say, oh, there's some distance there, but you'll get this. This is why a lot of the time mapping is dangerous in urban design because you can think there's a relationship there but from the plane of consistency there is no relationship and they call it consistency because it's, our experience is consistent it goes right the way through you get the difference plan plane from above the plane of organization plane of consistency which is the plane of experience one thing's moving and they call it the plane because of the fact that we also view things from uh, you know, the front. And this is where there's a reading there I've given called horizontality, which is really around the fact that there was a, that in a way Deleuze would talk about frontality, which is that you look at something this way, perpendicular to your movement direction. Your direction is that way. But what you're seeing, the front of it, is perpendicular to it. So you're moving across visual planes that are in front of you. And so this is where, in a way, it's a kind of, when we look at Jackson Pollock's painting, on the one hand, it's made in the horizontal. It's a record of something that's been made from some, not something where it's splattered. It's a process. It's a record of a horizontal process that's viewed as a vertical surface. And I use this as a, the reason I have this image here is to say that in terms of the plane of, of organization, the relations between, say, Center Camp and Camp Deliciosa over here 
were relatively straightforward. On foot and walking, it would take half an hour to get there, and potentially you would never get there because something would happen half a street away. And so the plane of organization and the plane of consistency were completely separated from each other. Um, okay, let's just stop that one.